So um, Gwen and uh, Christina um, talked quite a bit already about um, Creative Commons. The bit I would like to focus on is our policy work, which is one of just several areas of importance to us, uh, I would say kind of in relation to such things as outreach and education or community building. And this is the part on which I, w I focus. And I would like to talk about um, different open policies that are currently being implemented in different countries. And the main argument I would like to make is that um, Ireland, which seems very advanced in thinking about copyright reform, should consider introducing open policies as sort of um, uh, a way of building synergy for ultimately the same goals, which I would define as very broadly understood both user rights and um, support for innovation and creativity, which is the subject of this conference. Um, just very briefly, I, I will try to uh, suggest that we can go beyond thinking about open educational policy, open access policy, open research and science policy, um, open heritage policy and so on, and think about something that we could call maybe an open everything or open all policy. Um, and the question is how, what it should look like. Um, just to make it clear, by open I understand the combination <clears throat> of two things that the policy should secure. It should allow access to content, but should also provide user rights, so allow users to make a use of this content. And the key question is whether there is a single standard of openness, and if there is one, whether it's quite rigid or, for instance, needs to be quite flexible to accommodate for obvious differences between different excuse me, sectors where we you know, produce and use works. Um, another, and, and two sort of issues are crush, crucial, and I think these different sectors, um, uh, in different sectors, these are approached very differently due to you know, certain traditions of, say, education as opposed to science. And the one question is how important is access versus reuse? So, for example, in academic institutions, when you look at scientific journals, you don't really have a reuse need, right? You just want to read the article and, and use the knowledge. It's very different in education where you actually want to be using and reusing educational materials. And the other key, key question is what's the difference between thinking about public and private content or publicly funded and privately funded content? In, you know, in our opinion, while with regard to private, it's an issue of just good standards that you can set and recommend. We believe that with public funding, there are good reasons to think about obligatory um, open policies. Um, one thing I want to mention, and I think it's a, it's a development that you can see if you follow Creative Commons for you know the last decade that it has been in existence, or even a bit longer, is that there's a shift from mainly grassroots activities. Right, Creative Commons started as sort of a voluntary project that started functioning at, uh, at the margin and used a certain you know uh, mechanism existing within copyright law to fix it when reform was not possible. But it all depended on voluntary actions of rights owners. Um, I think with time we can see a shift in our our focus towards uh, working with policies. What does that mean? I think we understand that policies offer very strong leverage for the certain you know, legal models that we support. Um, and as I said, if it's publicly funded, it's, I think there are very strong sort of um, maybe even moral reasons. You know, we can think of, of this content we're talking about either as a public commons or as a kind of infrastructure that maybe shares a lot of elements with other types of publicly provided infrastructure like, say, the electricity grid or the road system. And I know this, these systems become partially privatized. It's a big uh, debate all over Europe, probably in Ireland as well. Um, but to some extent, they're almost always also have a public element. The question is, should knowledge and educational content be a similar kind of infrastructure? But the one thing that, that sort of, um, I, th I think a certain danger of working with policies is they, they lack this engaging mechanism where a person herself or himself decides to release content, right? You're obliged by a certain regulation. You publish an article, it's publicly funded. You're forced to do so. I don't think there's not anything negative about that. It, it's normal that we follow certain rules we set as a society, but just this personal dimension might not be there. And I think it's just a question for us to find ways of explaining policies in, in ways that still engage people. And Christina shows very well how to do that. 
Um, and, and I don't have time to go into, a, say, a sh even short review of these different areas, as you probably know. Uh, fields like free and open software um, and open access have a very long history, uh, you know, probably two to three decades. And then there are newer developments. Open educational uh, sort of movement has really crystallized around 2007 or 8, though obviously everyone can show that it has a longer history, but sort of the moment it became visible. So kind of different, and, and then glam, open glam ideas, even young. Younger. So I would say we're kind of seeing a gradual development of open models across all sectors and some issues they have to deal with that are common. I think we could kind of create a template that you have to address in every such sector and this is an issue. How do you store content? How do you market with metadata? How do you make rights holders or creators compliant with the policy? What are the respective legal or in particular licensing standards you have to introduce? And um, what are the use and reuse practices you need to take into account? And we could kind of map it in some kind of a table and compare these areas, which is a sort of useful exercise. We might want to do at some point to see whether there's an overall um, policy that model that can be built. Um, one key thing I want to mention is that a policy, open policies don't necessarily include licensing issues. So a traditional open access model very um, kind of uh, consciously uh, activists decided not to go into a policy debate. They didn't want to convince, for instance, in the United States, in the uh, National Institute of Health Bill, which was sort of one of the first really big uh, you know, policy developments that made uh, open access possible at a large scale, they didn't introduce license, content licensing. They just felt this is too difficult sort of to achieve. Um, but this has been changing, for instance, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which you probably know well if you're into um, science, science and open access, um, in its um, sort of rewritten version after a decade in the BOIA 10 document introduces a strong language recommending um, free licensing uh, with a Creative Commons attribution or related license. Um, and again, I think public funding is a, is a good reason to believe that we shouldn't just make content available because that's what you do without explicit licensing. You provide content and the user only depends on um, exceptions and limitations. I say only, but it's often actually quite a lot, right? But it's, um, I'll talk a bit more about it, but, but there are reasons for which it's very good um, model to think that people, should, users should depend on the exceptions and limitations, but of course they're across Europe fragmented, people are not very well aware about them, it's not easy to communicate with them, and this is something we feel that licensing can often solve also in practical terms. And one thing I wanted to mention, the licensing debate, I think it's important to mention that there are not just licenses, but there are several definitions that try to kind of standardize the open licensing, I think the open knowledge definition, which is kind of stewarded by the Open Knowledge Foundation, but actually by a community, there's a community mechanism, collaborative mechanism there, um, is a very good sort of um, standard setting mechanism for the licenses itself. I recommend having a look at this. But I mentioned there's a licensing debate. It's also worth noting that we're going beyond the licensing debate, even with a, within Creative Commons, uh, organization and community sort of explicitly tasked with um, stewarding a certain set of license. And I'd like to point out to a policy development achieved this year by our community where um, Creative Commons, um, the organization has produced an official statement on copyright reform where you can, for instance, read that we are dedicated stewards of our licenses and tools, but the CC vision of universal access to research and education and full participation in culture will not be realized through licenses alone, um, and thus CC supports ongoing efforts to reform copyright law. And I think, um, for instance, this conference itself, uh, I think, follows a, a similar intuition that we need to combine the, the sort of licensing, voluntary licensing approaches with um, copyright reform approaches. And this is finally something that's very well visible, I think, at the European level. If you have been following the Licenses for Europe process, it's at the start a year ago, uh, defined as a sort of parallel two-track process, where one was a consultation process, in our opinion, not very successful, about just licensing mechanism. And in the background, there was an ongoing research conducted by the Commission um, on the possibilities and needs of copyright reform, and this has led to the current um, consultation. Um, one risk that's there for open licensing advocates, and we see this risk not very often but actually taking place in, in reality is that open licensing will be used as an excuse um, explaining no need for copyright reform. So the argument goes, 
There's a lot of flexibility provided by open licensing. These are voluntary mechanisms. They're very well known. Creative Commons is doing a great job uh, stewarding these licenses. So you don't really need to uh, reform copyright to achieve flexibility you are talking about. Um, the, the, the argument I think has been made several times in Australia, Germany, Austria, for example. Fortunately, it didn't occur, which is interesting, during discussions on text and data mining uh, in the European Licenses for Europe process, where the um, rights holders, mainly the publishers, were making a very strong argument against a copyright exception for text and data mining, which is, for instance, being considered in the UK. Um, and, and we are fearing that they'll use exactly this argument, you know, we'll release this under a Creative Commons license and, and everything will be fine. But, but there is such risk, um, I think, worth um, taking into account. Um, um, for example, I should mention that it was actually a big success in the concurrent work on the um, Directive on Collective Management of Copyright, a clause was introduced which basically opens a possibility or even um, uh, will force collecting societies to allow hopefully uh, the use of free licensing by its members. I'm saying hopefully because the ultimate language is very vague. Um, but so again, this will be an issue of, of proper positioning by Creative Commons and its affiliates and its partners, uh, what this open licensing means and it shouldn't limit uh, reform approaches. Um, I would like now to talk very briefly about Poland where we're doing this kind of open policy work. Um, and to give two examples, one is a project on open textbooks, um, which is, an, from what I know, a first national level project to create freely licensed uh, full set of textbooks. Um, and um, it's worth knowing that that the reason this project was created is it goes back at least five years that the context has been built for such work. So I don't think you can sort of drop open policies into a country and hope they will work and educators will align and publishers will align. But we've been working, for instance, we've built a coalition for open education, which by now has around 20 um, members and which has been active by, for five years. And in the past, the public sector has already created smaller, similar projects. For instance, Polska Szkoła, the Polish school, is a project that provides content for Polish schools abroad. I wouldn't be surprised if there's one probably in Dublin for the Polish diaspora and, and their children. So, you know, it was kind of um, uh, steps taken earlier and a policy debate that has been ongoing for several years. So in 2012, as part of a larger digital school program, which I think is again an important thing to mention, that this is a policy that's part of a larger educational um, uh, modernization program called the digital school has been introduced. And interestingly enough, if you follow open educational issues, the commission with the new opening up education initiative is following this model that OER is part of a larger program that also includes um, equipment transfer to schools and skills. Um, and I think the, the open textbooks, I, I um, talk about it because I think the program has set a very good and high standard. It's not only free licensing under an attribution license, but it follows the WCAG rules for um, uh, usability by people with um, disabilities and open technical format uh, as a norm. Um, and and though there is, this is not a legislative act that's at the basis of this, which is sort of a weak part of this program, but we can see that this is al already sort of spreading to other programs. So there's a portal called Scholaris for other types of educational content and textbooks, and already we're seeing parts of it being made open. Um, there's a new program to purchase key uh, rights to key liter literary works, which obviously have an also educational use uh, for the goal of making it public. So I think it's, it, it shows that such policies spread. So obviously the ultimate goal is to have it set in a legislative act. We've been trying to develop a concept like that based on the belief that there can be a general model for uh, openness introduced. There are previous examples of such models being introduced in Australia, the Oz goal and New Zealand NZ goal, which stands for Government Open Access Licensing Framework. Um, and we developed a bill proposal which is very briefly tries to complement public sector information rules. Interestingly enough, it complicates the picture. I don't know how many of you deal both with copyright and PSI rules, but for instance, in the OKFM talk, you could already see that if you're dealing, say, with open data, this is unavoidable, and this is what we realize in Poland, that such an open policy ultimately deals with very similar content. It's not easy to do a border with 
PSI rules, so you need to kind of um, make them complementary. Uh, we proposed a rule that would work for public and, and publicly funded content, so produced beyond the institutions but with public funding. It's an interesting question, where do you set the mark? 50% seems most obvious, but actually I think it should be sort of evidence-based decision. Uh, maybe it should be higher, for instance, for some areas. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the most controversial bit was not how to make it available, but how to transfer the rights from rights owners to public institutions. And the um, uh, lawyers working with the government proposed that there should be a model of rights transfer or a quite complicated co-ownership model. The alternative would be just to comply uh, rights owners to license themselves. And it turned out that this, this really raised uh, basically a hell of a debate uh, in, part in relation mainly to cultural works. Because I should mention that the bill was designed to address at once culture, education, and science. That was sort of the challenge to build a model that works in three very different areas. Um, and there was actually, it, it was kind of varied model. This was sort of borrowed from the New Zealand and Australian model. So there are three tiers of openness, starting with open access, with no reuse rights, moving through a basically a non-commercial rights use allowed model to a full open license. On top of that, there was an opt-out option for any institution and funding program and an embargo period. So we really felt we did a lot to make this a very flexible program that wouldn't be invasive. And despite of that, it raised very um, high criticism mainly from the cultural sector. And I think this is an interesting, just I won't go into details about that, but I want to mention that often it's felt that copyright reform is the contentious issue and open licensing is kind of just an issue of awareness. I think when you start talking about policy, um, this policy obviously affects interest groups, which at some point feel um, threatened. Um, I think it's worth noting that while, while there's no talk yet of such a unified policy at European level, if you take into account all the different initiatives which uh, are present both in the research sector with the Horizon 2020 program, in the educational sector with the new opening up education strategy, but also with relation say to open data, and the current copyright review, I think we'll get to a point where uh, either we'll realize in practice there's such a norm or maybe even uh, the commission will start entertaining the idea of introducing such general standards. Um, and, and just to end, um, I want to mention that we are at Creative Commons focusing currently on educational policy. We feel there's an opportunity in Europe due to the new opening up education strategy, uh, which again is interesting because it doesn't deal just with openness, but it allows us to very practically demonstrate the advantages of openness in the educational community. Because one insight we uh, very strongly <coughs> believe in is that a lot of people are not really interested in openness. This is a difficult issue. They wa don't want to deal with legal aspects. They're interested in quality of content, uh, ease of education, effectiveness of their public uh, institutions. And there's, so there's this translation we need to do and we need to attach uh, open issues to other policy issues. So for instance, I really liked the Swedish uh, project Christina presented where it ties openness with media education. Media education is something doesn't need, people don't need to be convinced this is important. Um, we'll be presenting in the coming month policy research on issues uh, related to open education. And we're doing an event in mid-February in the European Parliament to which I already invite you and um, information will be soon available online on the details of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.